Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, as we commemorate the martyrdom of the commander of the faithful, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, afdal salati wa salam alayhi, it's befitting that we choose a topic that speaks on his akhlaq and how he lived his life. Today we're going to be talking about emotional intelligence. If we study the life of Imam Ali, we could see that he is a beacon for how our akhlaq should be. And that is exactly why we chose this topic today. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, wa salatu wa salamu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Respected brothers and sisters, friends, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As we begin to commemorate the martyrdom of the commander of the faithful, Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, I believe that it is very important to discuss some of his merits, some of his virtues. And many of you, in fact, all the Muslims, have heard of the generosity of Imam Ali, of the knowledge of Imam Ali, mm -hmm. of the bravery of Imam Ali. However, today we have decided to discuss a unique topic, a topic that is discussed often today. Um, it's a very popular topic uh, of emotional intelligence. Therefore, we will discuss this topic that I think is uh, very important for the happiness of individuals, for the success of individuals, and try to seek lessons from the life of Al-Imam Amir al muminin so that we can incorporate those lessons and stories within our lives. So today we're going to be talking about a few main points, inshallah. First, we're going to define emotional intelligence, talk about what it is. Then we'll talk about how emotional intelligence and leadership are interlinked. We'll then talk about how we can uh, become emotionally intelligent ourselves or more emotionally intelligent than what we already are. We'll speak on the foundations of emotional intelligence. We'll speak on the importance of mindfulness and its impact on our life. And then, in the end, we'll tie it all together and speak on the akhlaq of Amir al-Mu'mineen and his emotional intelligence. So, when we talk about emotional intelligence, obviously that has to do with our feelings, how we uh, carry ourselves. And, but I know it's a lot more than that. So, could you start us off by basically defining what emotional intelligence is? Um... So in, uh, in a nutshell, if we want to simplify this whole uh, definition and, uh, and, 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 and try to understand it from our perspective, uh, I would say it's, uh, it's to become intelligent in the way we behave, in the way we understand our emotions, in the way we understand the emotion of others. Right in the manner in which we deal with others and in, in, in the way that we conduct ourselves and our relationships um, in order to make better decisions, um, we need emotional intelligence. Right. In order to understand ourselves and be self-aware, we need emotional intelligence. In order for us to have successful relationships, we need emotional intelligence. In order for us to uh, be good parents, we need emotional intelligence, to be a good teacher, to be a good politician. Uh, all of that requires that we are uh, uh, emotionally aware. Right. So when we talk about uh, emotional intelligence, we see that it's interlinked with leadership. For example, you see some people, very successful individuals, they're not only intelligent, but, you know, in book smarts, rather, but they're also emotionally intelligent, and that's the mark of a great leader. So how are those two things interlinked? Yeah, you see, I believe that you know, once, you, uh, once you are a successful person in whatever field you're in, 
um, whether you're a politician or you're a teacher mm -hmm. or you're an athlete or you're a businessman, you're a CEO, whatever you may be, the people that are in your caliber have to be intelligent as well. Right. Uh, however, uh, what's going to set a very successful person from a successful person Mm -hmm. What's going to set a successful person uh, on a mediocre level from a, a, a very success, highly effective person, yeah. highly successful person, is their level of emotional intelligence. Meaning, um, the way that they're going to analyze uh, the behavior of others and themselves and the reaction of others towards them and make better decisions. For example, if, if, you're, uh, if you are an uh, uh, emotionally intelligent businessman, then you would know, uh, let's say you have two people that have the same resume, right. um, have the same IQ, um, and uh, who are you going to end up choosing? Who are you going to end up giving the job to, mm -hmm. hiring for the position? I think that then in that, in that uh, uh, right there and then, you're going to need to have uh, emotional intelligence to tell you that this is the right person for the job. Right. Um, or, for example, how you communicate with your employees, mm -hmm. how you try to understand your employees, how you try to motivate them, how you try to communicate to them. Um, that all goes back to emotional intelligence. That's going to set your company apart from other companies. That's how, for example, a company like Apple operates, mm -hmm. using emotional intelligence, spending, in fact, millions of dollars on emotional intelligence of their customers or of their employees and, and, and the way that... They make people feel when they are in, inside their store, the way that people feel when they are using their products, the way they deal with their employees. Um, that's, you know, that's what set Apple apart from BlackBerry, though right. BlackBerry was there many years before them. Right. Um, or if you're a coach, if you're a trainer, if, if, if you're somebody who's training people or you're coaching them, you know, you have to understand the emotional, with, through your emotional intelligence, you have to understand and evaluate the emotion of, uh, emotions of those who you're dealing with. Right. Um, for example, if you want to motivate someone, how do you motivate this particular person? If you want to push this person to work harder, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is it that's going to make this person feel better? What is it that's going to make this person feel weak? What is it that's going to make this person try harder? And what is it that's going to make this person fail or give up completely? Um, you're going to have to be able to understand those and apply them differently to different people. You can't just apply the same formula to everybody. Uh, an emotionally intelligent politician, for example, is a person who understands, uh, for example, his community. And sees, why is it that they're angry? Why is it that they hate me? Why is it that they are upset? Why is it that they voted this way? And through that, be unable to give solutions to his community. And that is how, uh, you know, highly successful leaders can, can survive. Same goes for a teacher. You know, um, working on the confidence of someone. Um, uh, how is it that this person is going to flourish is it if i become friends with this person is it if i start doubting this person you know, how how will they react towards fear how will they react towards lack of respect how will they react towards hate how will they, re they react towards joy mm -hmm. all those things are uh, part of our understanding of others so that we can become more successful in our journey with them Right. Uh, so, you know, if you're a father, if you're a teacher, you're a coach or a politician or every person in society, you are definitely in need uh, of emotional intelligence. And that's what's going to set people apart from each other. Studies show that uh, people with the same exact scores in high school, mm -hmm. people with the same exact IQ in high school, uh, you know, uh, in their 20th reunion or 10th reunion, some of them were just very ordinary people, mm -hmm. happened to be very ordinary people, and some of them happened to be the most successful people, at least in their school or some of them in their city. Mm -hmm. And when they went back to those individuals and re-examined them and re-analyzed them, they realized what set 
the successful person who just happened to be probably somebody that's averagely successful right. uh, or successful on an average compared to other people around them. But a highly successful person was their emotional intelligence, the way they were able to understand others, understand relationships, understand themselves, motivate themselves, motivate others, work as a team. And that's what emotional intelligence is all about. Yeah, that, that's a good way to summarize it and, and basically draw on how the best leaders and most successful people use emotional intelligence uh, as, as a tool for their success. So after we talk about that, how, what can we do as individuals? You know, some people may not be um, fit for leadership roles or things of that nature, but still I'm sure we can, uh, every one of us could draw um, some knowledge from emotional intelligence and see where we can improve in our lives. How could we start to do that? Well, I think that you would have to first understand the very foundations of emotional intelligence, the very basis of the emotional of emotional intelligence. And, um, you know, I, I from what I have understood and from what I gather mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, emotional intelligence has uh, several main foundations. Right. The very first one, the very the most important one is self-awareness. Mm -hmm. For you to have uh, an understanding of yourself, t for you to, and we'll talk about this later, but just to sum, her up, sum it up, for you to understand how you feel, why is it that you feel this way? Mm -hmm. uh, what has led you to, for example, be in such a state of pain or anger mm -hmm. or emotion, or, or, or why, are, why are you, for example, an emotional wreck? So kind of like uh, reflecting. Depression. So you have to understand the, the feeling. You have to first be able to identify whether this is sadness or whether this is anger. Mm -hmm. And then you have to understand what is the cause of this and how long does it stay with you? For example, uh, you know, if, if you see other people becoming successful uh, that you know, are the same age, had the same opportunities, you grew up together, now one of them is ending. You know, one of them is uh, one of your friends is you know a millionaire now, or he's somebody who is considered very successful, and you're not. It's it's normal for people to feel that they're missing out on something, or or they feel jealousy, or they feel like I need to basically step up my game. Mm -hmm. Those are normal feelings. But how long do the fee does the feeling last and what does it make you do? If it's only making you angry, mm -hmm. if uh, it's not pushing you to try harder, to be innovative yourself, to, 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 to aim for success for yourself, but if it's driving you to go after that person right. and to take away his success and to go around saying, you know what, this guy just had it made... And, yeah. and, and try to defame that person. Being a hater, kind of. Exactly. That is a ridiculous way of reacting to your emotions. So you have to understand why is it that I'm reacting this way. Right. Number two is self-management of your emotions. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you know, uh, if you have jealousy, if you self-manage it, it's going to cause you success. But if you let it, you know, uh, take the best of you, then you're going to go after that guy, try to take him down, and you're never going to be successful. Right. Or, for example, um, if you have a competitive nature. Right. If you have a competitive nature, the same thing applies. Uh, if you feel hate towards people who have wronged you, if that stays in you for a very long time, it's going to self-destruct you. Right. Um, you know, it's not going to give you success. It's not going to change anything in the situation. You have mm -hmm. to understand that you know, if something has gone wrong, how is it that you're going to change the situation to your advantage? So managing your anger, managing your sadness, managing your joy. You know, sometimes with joy, some people will become lazy mm -hmm. and some people with joy will become proactive. So you have to be able to manage um, your emotions to right. your advantage. Number three is empathy. Mm -hmm. How you understand other people's emotions. Um, why is it that this person feels this way towards me? And being able to um, understand why people feel angry or sad or heartbroken or disappointed with certain things that we do. And I'll give you a very uh, common example. 
I'm sure everybody here has uh, felt in a certain time or, or often that people will tell you, oh, you know, you wronged me, you broke my heart, or you, mm. you, uh, you lied to me, or you, you hurt me, whatever, you know, right. all, all those things that are negative. And you're thinking to yourself, how did I do that? Mm. You know, I, I cannot understand how was this possible. In fact, if anything, I expected this person, for example, to praise me, right. to thank me, to, to say the exact opposite of what they've just said. So there's two cases here. One is that I do not understand this person well. Okay. And number two is this person does not understand me well. So it is the lack of this person's understanding of me that makes them say those things. Mm -hmm. Or it is my understanding, my lack of understanding of this person that I've communicated the wrong things to them. Now, if you're stuck in such situations, mm -hmm. then you're going to need to look up emotional intelligence. You're going to get, you must get yourself more emotionally intelligent. You must start being able to look for clues um, and, 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 and try to understand people. Uh, for example, a, a book that is a bestseller, um, amazing book, Five Languages of Love, mm. um, or, or something like that, five, yeah, I think so, I think it's the five love languages or something like that, something along those lines, um, that I summarized and I actually gave a lecture on, uh, tells you that every person has a different love language. Right. And that is how you have to have emotional intelligence to differentiate between them differentiate between those five for example some it is to um, give them words of affirmation right so and for others it's giving them gifts mm -hmm. uh, for others it's like helping them and assisting them uh, for others it's uh, it's a quality time mm -hmm. so I remember those five languages but now a smart person and uh, an emotionally intelligent person is a one who is able to differentiate between those two and see which one it is that I need to communicate with this person. And last is having skilled relationships. Emotional intelligence will teach you to have skilled relationships. So once you understand yourself, once you understand your emotions, where they came from, uh, how can you control them, how can you manage them, and then you understand the emotions of others, then you are able to create... Uh, relationships based on a better understanding of yourself and others and they will definitely be successful relationships um, I think that is how you know people can get started on becoming more emotionally intelligent right where did researchers get this from I mean like where is the what, what are the foundations of emotional intelligence and how can researchers basically sum all of this up and tell us um, this is emotional intelligence, this is how to live your life better. Uh, in your opinion, what are the foundations of emotional intelligence? Well, I uh, well, the foundations of emotional intelligence I just discussed right oh, now. Sorry. But um, I believe that once it comes to research, uh -huh. the research of those topics, um, I think that, you know, it starts with people being studied and examined um, and, and, and then conclusions are drawn. For example, um, people who meditate and people who don't meditate. Mm -hmm. If they're studied for 10 years or 5 years, uh, people who, for example, reflect on their emotions and the emotions of others, compared to people who are clueless on the topic, those people are put next to each other, and then, you know, um, uh, they they try to study them and try to study their uh, their behavior um, and, and and what is it that makes them uh, 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 happy uh, what is it that's caused their success and what is it that has caused the success uh, the failure of others you see you see successful people sometimes are angry uh, sometimes successful people are toxic. Sometimes successful people are uh, not able to control their emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, but people who are just chill, I guess it's not uh, as bad for them. Because look, I mean, once you have so many responsibilities, once you 
expect so much of yourself, uh, then you're going to judge yourself differently than somebody who is just always content with their situation, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with, with where they are in life. Um, so that there, those things are going to set those individuals apart. That's right. Uh, now, um, a, an emotionally intelligent person is the person who is able to uh, understand those emotions and work them to their advantage. And that's, what's, that's what emotional intelligence teaches us. Uh, for example, if you keep yourself on high standards, very high standards, and if you fail yourself, then you're all constantly going to shame yourself. Oh, I'm not good enough. I didn't do well. Uh, I wish I tried harder. I versus somebody who's chill mm -hmm. is gonna be like you know that's it. I'm I'm doing whatever I I want. You know I I have this this very simple life and I'm content with it. The rest of the time you find them just enjoying themselves and being happy. And I'm not saying that is okay, by the way, right. for you to just uh, uh, waste your life by being content with something that is mediocre, something that is small. However, for the successful person, now in order to re remove all those toxic habits or feelings or emotions, you're going to have to reflect on yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, for you not to shame yourself, for you not to hate yourself, for you not to uh, be disappointed in yourself, uh, for you not to feel that you failed yourself and others, you're going to have to be able to reflect, you're going to have to be able to... Um, uh, be more self-aware. Yeah, so from what I've understood, it seems that mindfulness is a core of emotional intelligence. Um, it's a pillar of emotional intelligence. Uh, what is the impact of mindfulness on our personal lives, our relationships, um, how we carry ourselves, so on and so forth? Yeah, you know, um, I feel that... Um, when it comes to uh, your happiness, you have to understand that you are responsible for your own happiness. Others are not responsible for your happiness. Mm -hmm. you, know, you may start blaming others. Why is this person not making me happy? Why is this person making me angry? Why did this person make me feel miserable? You know, uh, or, or, the hap or your happiness is not going to be caused by other people. Uh, it's not going to be caused for your sig by your significant other. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be caused by your friends or your employees or your or whatever it is. It's going to be caused by yourself because you can be with that person who you thought is going to make you really happy. Right. But after a while or after a special circumstance, you realize, no, it's gone. That happiness is gone. It was temporary. Or if I buy this car, then I'm going to be, I'm going to feel very happy. Or if I, uh, for example, end up at this job, I'm going to be very happy. If I live in this neighborhood, I'm going to be very happy. That's all temporary. Mm -hmm. That will not last. Especially with how people are today. How people are so artificial. How, um, you know, I can even use the word fake. A lot of people mm -hmm. will, will be fake with you. The way they deal with you. The way they get close to you. The way they... Uh, they behave towards you, it really takes a very long time for you to understand if those people are truly who they are. Right. Are they truly loyal? Do they truly appreciate who you are and what you're doing? Uh, do they have any hidden agendas? And I think that you know it takes a long time. Why? Because you have to understand them when they're happy. You have to understand them when they're sad. You have to understand them when they're angry. Mm -hmm. You have to understand them when they're financially doing well. You have to understand them when they're not doing so well. So in the end of the day, the conclusion that I have to draw is you are responsible for your own happiness. Right. You know, in the end of the day, you can make yourself happy. You can decide to make yourself happy or not. And that all goes back to uh, uh, mindfulness. Mm -hmm. So let me explain mindfulness uh, uh, briefly. Mindfulness is being able to identify uh, who you are. Um, for example, a study showed, I read this, that a study showed uh, someone asked his clients or those who were participating in, in his uh, class on mindfulness right. uh, to close their eyes 
um, to think a little bit, and then when they open their eyes, they would ask the person sitting next to them, who are you? Mm-hmm. And this person would, you know, start introducing themselves, oh, I'm John, I'm 25 years old, I come from this city, this is what I do for a living, and, and maybe if they were like, you know, trying to, trying extra hard, they would say, oh, those are my hobbies. Uh, so he would say, close your eyes again, open them, and uh, ask the same question. So the second time people were uh, 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 getting a little more detailed. You know, I mm-hmm. I come from a broken family. I just broke up with my girlfriend. I have four kids. I have, you know, uh, massive credit card debts. Uh, or uh, I'm somebody who gets angry a lot. I'm somebody who's happy. I'm somebody who's... And then it would stop there. And mm-hmm. obviously this guy says that that's not who you are. That's not... That's part of who you are. That's some of who you are. But right. that's very little. That's the exterior of who you are. The interior, you only know it. Mm-hmm. Now, this person says, I did not ask them to do that the third time. Because if I did, they some a lot of them don't even know what's the inside of them like. Mm-hmm. So they wouldn't be, they would be like, okay, we introduced ourselves twice. We don't know what else to say. So right. mindfulness is being able, is for you to be able to understand what is inside of you. I see. Uh, what it is not, what is not in the exterior, what mm-hmm. you know of yourself, um, and that is the only way that you are able to actually have successful relationships. Mm-hmm. That is why we have a hadith that says, "Man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba. Whoever knows himself, mm-hmm. whoever understands the the inside of himself, is able to then understand Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. To have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To build this relationship based on success. Right. Now, if you don't know yourself, then you cannot have successful relationships. Because you don't know what it is that's causing all those emotions within you. For you to act this way. For you to say the things that you say. You know, sometimes we human beings can... To the most, to the dearest people to us, we can say the most hurtful things right. and, and literally think, oh, it's okay. Uh, this person needs to hear it. And I feel, I always feel that's part of being an unmindful person. Mm. Because you have to understand when to say it, how to say it. And if you've done something 200 times and it hasn't worked, don't do it again. Find another way. That right. is being an, uh, an emotionally intelligent person. And... Uh, an emotionally unintelligent person is the person who tries to push their way into you more than a thousand times for 10 years straight. And that's how marriages fail. That's mm-hmm. how people distance themselves from their parents and what have you. So let's get back to mindfulness. Mindfulness is for you to understand the essence of who you are right. and some of the most important feelings that, and desires that you have. And, and to understand them, not to be afraid of them, not to run away from them. Um, so, for example, uh, let's come to a, a very powerful feeling, uh, such as uh, shame, or such as guilt, mm. or such as self-hate. Right. Those exist in many people. And uh, you have to understand, how did that shame uh, begin? You know, how, how did it end up in you? How did the self-hate or guilt end up in you? Mm-hmm. And then what, what is it doing? So it's telling you that, you know, you don't enjoy, you, you, you don't deserve a better life. You don't deserve to enjoy life. You don't deserve to be successful. You don't deserve anything good. You start hating yourself. You start being so ashamed of yourself. And this happens to many people uh, who have committed crime or war veterans. Right. In fact, this is, you know, you know, war, people don't die in wars. And mm-hmm. Most soldiers in America don't end up dying in the battlefield. In combat, yeah. They don't end up dying in combat. They end up dying uh, when they come home. Right. Why? Because they commit suicide. They are ashamed of themselves. Mm-hmm. They, they cannot tolerate what they have done. So they end up committing suicide or they end up hating themselves for the rest of their lives. Uh, such feelings, you have to understand where they came from and how is it that you are able to control them. Um, and that is part of self-awareness. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses this in the Holy Quran. 
and he introduces this topic as the topic of khushu' mm -hmm. khushu' is being mindful of yourself and your situation yeah. uh, understanding it that is khushu' um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, discusses this mentions that the, 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 the word khushu' or the terminology khushu' 15 times in the Holy Quran mm -hmm. and that is a state of self-awareness when your heart is enlightened when your heart is aware so if you were to be translating passages from the Holy Quran, khushu' is you know always translated into humility, right? But it is not. Sometimes it's you know enlightenment. Sometimes mm. it's humility. Sometimes it's mindfulness. Right. You have to understand the context of how the Quran is using it. But all of that uh, uh, speaks of the state of khushu', and that is why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. Uh, as the salah is accepted once there's khushu. Once you understand yourself, once you understand your situation, once you're able to focus. Yeah. Focusing is one of the, uh, I would say, most important uh, practices of self uh, awareness or, or, or emotional intelligence for you to be able to focus. Yeah. That is the key to success. Uh, if you're not able to focus, then, you know, like for example, studies show that 47% of the times when you're supposed to be focused on something, uh, your mind wanders elsewhere. 47% of the time, yeah. half of the time, uh, your, your mind is somewhere else. But if you're able to get your mind to focus at that right. moment, then you are uh, able to be successful. And, and, and paying attention to that particular issue. Uh, so that is the concept of khushu' yeah. uh, that is mentioned in the religion of Islam, being able to focus, being able to think, and being able to be self-aware at the same time. And Allah says you need this in salah. If you yeah. have this in salah, if you're able to focus completely, away from all sorts of distractions, mm -hmm. then you will be achieving great things in life. Yeah, you know, that's, that's difficult. The khushu' during prayer, when we start our salah, we start thinking of what we have to do for the day, or did I keep the stove on? Your mind just wanders sometimes, and um, even if you have to repeat your salah, maybe if you feel like you're not completely focused, uh, you should try to do that. Obviously, khushu' there is no other better example of khushu' than Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam. Can we talk about how Amir al-Mu'mineen lived his life and his emotional intelligence, how his akhlaq were? Yeah, obviously, um, we know that, you know, the um, we have two, major, two types of jihad in Islam, right. struggles. One that is a jihad al-akbar and one that is a jihad al-azghar. Al-jihad al-azghar is the physical battlefield, mm -hmm. where obviously Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen was the... Uh, you know, the commander-in-chief of the army of Rasulullah. He single-handedly won the battles of Rasulullah. Mm -hmm. uh, he is the one that is praised by Jibra'il. La fata illa ali la sayf illa dhul fuqar. But this was his minor mm -hmm. jihad. His major jihad as Rasulullah explains to his companions. The major jihad of all Muslims is their inner struggle. Mm -hmm. And Amir al-Mu'mineen was able to win this battlefield so successfully. Uh, traditions indicate that when he became the Khalifa, the most powerful man, and uh, they would bring, he would sometimes go to the treasury, mm -hmm. and he would see that there are mountains of gold and silver in the treasury, and he could do whatever he wants with them. In fact, people before him and after him did so. Right. They gave to the Arabs more than the non-Arabs. They gave to their family more than others. They, you know, so they decided what they wanted to do with that money. But Amir al-Mu'mini to his own brother Aqil, mm -hmm. he gave him exactly what he would give a black Abyssinian slave. Right. So he gave everybody equally. And uh, traditions indicate that once he was seen and witnessed in, in the midst of the gold and silver, and he would say, Ya Safra wa Ya Bayda. He wouldn't even call the yellow, the gold gold. He would say, mm -hmm. oh, yellow. And he would not call the silver silver. He would say, oh, white. Because gold and silver were something else to Imam Ali. 
Mm-hmm. Gold was the obedience of Allah. Gold was the rahmah of Allah. Gold was when he was able to make Allah happy. Gold one was, like for example, Amir al-Mu'minin says, if silence, if, if, uh, you know, if you were to speak, that is, uh, you know, good. But if you were to remain silent, that is golden. Meaning don't, don't speak as if you're not required to speak, you know, try right. to listen more often. So a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, merits for Amir al-Mu'minin were considered gold. A lot of things that he could have done to become a better person was considered gold. So he says, Ya Safra, wa ya bayda, ghurri ghayri. Now here is a person who's talking to himself, who's speaking to himself. Seduce someone besides me. Seduce someone else, not me. Ghurri ghayri. Abi taharrati, abi tashawakti, la hana hainuki, qad talaqtuki thalathan, la raj'ata fiki. Are you trying to seduce me? Are you trying to beautify yourself to me? I have divorced you and I will never go back to you. Meaning Imam Ali never saw gold and silver as something seductive to him. Um, so he was able to self-manage himself. He was able to be in that state of khushu'ah. Or for example, it reminds me of a story of Amir al uh where he, there was an arrow that went in his leg. Right. And they could not take out the arrow. And, uh, you know, the, the doctor said, Imam Hassan actually told them that the best time for you to take out the arrow from his leg mm-hmm. is when he is in salah. When he's in salah, he won't feel anything. He's so focused on Allah, he won't even feel the pain of the arrow coming out of his leg. And historians write that, you know, when Imam Ali was praying uh, his night prayers, mm-hmm. and he was in that state of communicating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they took out the arrow and he did not feel it. Uh, Subhanallah, you know, uh, uh, the Salman once went to Fatima to Zahra. He says, "I went with Salwa Kamsam. Sorry, Kamel went to Fatima to Zahra in the middle of the night, and he says, I went with the Imam Ali to the deserts, and he began to pray, and he began to supplicate, and he began to cry and weep so much out of the love that he has for Allah, out of the fear that he has from Allah, until he passed away, until he passed out. I went close to him, and I realized Ali's dead." I tried to wake him up, I tried to, and nothing, Ali's dead. Mm-hmm. So Fatima says, no, he's not. This is what happens to Amir al-Mu'mineen every night. Imagine someone who fatigues himself and his entire existence during the day for the sake of Allah. Whether it's jihad, whether it's serving the Prophet, whether it's serving the needy, you know that he would carry weight on his back. Mm-hmm. And he would go to those who were you know, hated him right. and to their orphans and to their children and he would give them from, you know, Bayt al-Mal and he would give them from his own uh, wealth and his what he had and um, and then, you know, doing all of that, spending time with your companions and all those things and, and, and Amir al-Mu'mineen dug whales, Amir al-Mu'mineen worked on farms, Amir al-Mu'mineen uh, helped people and then at night you're standing there in front of Allah doing salat al-layl and weeping and crying obviously when you pass out you're passed out mm-hmm. when you pass out you're going to look like a dead person mm-hmm. this is somebody who's productive this is somebody who left this legacy behind and Amir al-Mu'mineen calls on to us and he says if you can't be that then at least let m- let resemble me in the way, in your mannerism, in the way you act, in the way you behave. And like you said, you know, he's uh, an emotionally, not intelligent, but genius mm-hmm. uh, that uh, left such a legacy. Look at the way he dealt with his enemies. Look at mm-hmm. the way that he dealt with his friends. Look at his loyal companions. Amir al muminin had companions that were so loyal to him. That I, you know, yes, it's true that Imam Hussein had 72 of them. And he said, I have never seen or witnessed companions. And by that he means from the time of Adam until the end of time. As loyal as you and what have you. However, Imam Ali didn't have 72. Imam Ali, he had the few like Miqdad, like mm-hmm. Maytham. Maytham and Tamar, how can you explain the loyalty, the love, the... The, the, the way that he felt for Amir al-Mu'mineen. This was because Amir al-Mu'mineen was able to understand them. You know, when Amir al-Mu'mineen went to buy Maytham from the slavery market, uh, 
he was worthless, literally. He asked him, do you know how to do anything? He says, I know how to sell dates. He says, do you have any other trade that you know? Do you know? He says, no, I only know how to sell dates. And Amir al-Mu'mineen gave a lot of money for Maytham. And his companion said to him, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you could have gotten 10 slaves with that money. He says, I know something you don't know about this guy. He was able to pick that up. Uh-huh. He was able to understand it. Same thing for Kumail. Same thing for... Uh, uh, you know the rest of his companions so he was able to have that you know relationship with his companions the way that he was able to uh, communicate uh, with his enemies for example how he communicated with Amr ibn Wud on the day of Khandaq how he communicated on the day of Badr to his enemies how he com- communicated at Uhud how he made fe- people feel when they heard the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib on the battlefield same thing how he made people feel when they heard Amir al-Mu'mineen, the, you know, the orphans, they heard his name. They, they felt compassion, they felt mercy, they felt rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the legacy that we have from Imam Ali, a man with khushu' a man with emotional genius, uh, a man that we will be commemorating for the next three nights. But from here, and at this point, uh, before we conclude, we say to him, As-salamu alayka ya amir al-mu'mineen. As-salamu alayka ya qa'id al-ghurr al-muhajjaleen. As-salamu alayka ya asad Allah al-ghalib. As-salamu alayka wa ala ruhika wa badanik. As-salamu alayka wa ala al-bid'at al-tahirah, Fatima al-Zahra. As-salamu alayka wa ala ibn ammika wa akhik, amir al-mu'mineen. Rasul Allah, as-salamu alayka وعلى ولديك الحسن والحسين والأئمة من ذريتك يا سيدي ويا مولاي إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله You know, we, have, we are in a tough situation. <coughs> we ask Allah in the name of Imam Ali, in his blessed name, in his sacred name, يا وجيها عند الله أشفع لنا عند الله Thank you so much, Sayyid, for your wonderful... Uh, talk today. I, I learned a lot myself. I hope our viewers enjoyed the talk. Um, just to leave everyone with one last note. What I I know about the story about, um, you know, when Imam Ali was struck on the head. What was that quote? The famous quote? What, what did he say when? Of course, he when he was struck with the, with the, with the sword, he said, mm-hmm. Fustu Rabb al-Kaaba. Right. I have become victorious by the Lord of the Kaaba. Meaning I had a life of success. Wow. I am happy and content with my life. Nobody really is able to say that uh, besides this man um, that, you know, he ended his life saying that I am completely, I have, I mm-hmm. have, I have conquered victory. Yeah. MashaAllah. Thank you so much, Sayyid. Thank you to all of our viewers. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, we want to both thank you for your positive feedback, for your support. Thank you for keeping up with us. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to keep your questions within the comments uh, section of each flyer that we put out. Uh, It's kind of hard for us to check the live feed and see that um, what people are saying or what people are asking. Um, But I'd like to ask you all to please subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. That way we could live stream on YouTube. And give us your feedback, you know, tell us what we could improve with. Um, If you like our topics, if you want other topics, uh, inshallah, we'll try to keep the podcast going after Ramadan as well. Please keep us in your da'as in these few holy nights coming up. Um, And thank you so much, everyone. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.